Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ's righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at Joy-Coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. And I'm trying to get them that question. Get them that question. She shuts. We get done three hours later. She shuts five hours later. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's why. I <laughs> get three hours later. That, that was, as soon as she shut it off, we sat down there, we relaxed. And went, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. We stayed for another hour and a half. I mean, my. We didn't get home till one o'clock last night. Woo! You going home before that? Guarantee that. Well, they were much older than you, so they stayed up later. <laughs> no, I feel bad. <laughs> oh, 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 oh Lord. Amen. This is good. Ooh, so, so is it running or not? It is. It is. Because oh. last time I did not, you were like, oh, oh shit. That's, that's true, you did. Any, any... You're not going to hear it, are you? It's just, yeah, it's there. Does anybody have any questions? No, this is a small group. Let's ask some questions. Someone, somebody, somebody, let's get the ball rolling. Now, oh, you're got, not leaving, are you? He's coming back. I've got a ton of stuff that I can share on, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, I really. Anyway, and most of you have heard stuff already and heard it three or four times, maybe long, maybe more, it's, and it's, you still question it. No, just leave. Do you want me to turn it off? No, no, it's not being recorded. We... <laughs> because this one is one that need, has questions, but uh, he's not going to ask them. Okay, and I'll just ask for Okay. Yeah, ask him for him. There you go. Yeah, you know what's happening. Because I don't know with Tommy what he's thinking. And, yeah, I'm uh, asking for him. Okay, so, do you want me to turn it off or not? If you need it, it's up to you. Well, I'm going to be back. He, he ran home for a minute. I don't know. No, something, they need something there, so he's, he's running over there right quick. He'll be right. He just ran. His wife is. Has a little bit of temperature tonight, so she's so not here. Her so her back home well, get you. yeah, I just, just, I just, I just you can pass on the. So if you don't have any pertinent, I mean, like, hey Curtis, can you you talked about this the other day? Can you make that a little clearer? Let's hear it. Any questions we need to ask for you? I'll try to. I mean, yeah, yeah. Tell us what we need. Tell us what, what, Tell us what his questions are. Okay. So whoever's listening to this, <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. The background, the background that that they're associated with, still associated with, mm -hmm. is a Jesus name uh, only type belief, which they are believed in that you have to be sanctified by being baptized in Jesus' name, and you must speak in tongues in order to go to heaven, and and then you must obey the commandments of being holy and walking righteous and living a righteous life and that and that every day you're tempted and every day you should be asking forgiveness of sins and so those sins must be constantly 
always before you and constantly always asking God, help me today not to sin. Help me today to, to walk right and to be pleasing to you in your sight. And, and those are the, in the prayers of most of these type of religious people are, are morning prayers, prayers of mourning, not necessarily prayers of rejoicing. The rejoicing mm. comes when they're in evangelistic service. And when they're in evangelistic service, then they can rejoice. Yeah. But most of the times they spend their prayer closets in mourning, and it's always a prayer of mourning. All these two here, and us two, definitely know what I'm talking about because we have we came up through that, especially she did. And because I was raised Southern Baptist, but she was third generation of this. And when she had the problem that she had with her hair issue and lost her hair, we were by accident. By accident. But we was it an accident? We were best thing ever. <laughs> We that were, is exactly what it was. We were excommunicated. No we were excommunicated from fellowshipping in those rooms. Mm -hmm. And yet we could still come to church, but we could not be on the platform. We could not hold offices and positions in the church. And so these two here never could understand because they couldn't even understand why what happened to us when we found grace and came out of the grace movement. <clears throat> And I keep telling them, I said, the most important word that is lost out of, the, out of that religion, even though they'll swear that they, they, they'll swear that they use it, they know it, and they, they understand it and all that. But the truth is, the most important word is peace. Oh! They never have peace. Uh -uh. And they never can find peace. Uh -huh. Wow. And that's the most important thing that they are struggling with. And grace is not taught, grace is only taught as a igniter to everything. Yeah. That grace really don't save you, it just gets you to the place where you can be saved. Mm. It's just, it's, sure. that's, well, that's how, yeah. that's how yeah. I've never heard any. Well, I've got my Bible open. Oh, no. I've got my oh, Bible no. open, no. and there were a couple things we we're going to talk about tonight. One was, what is really grace? According to scripture, not mine's not theirs. What's a Bible say about grace? And we're going to talk about a couple uh, examples in scripture. And the other one we're going to talk about was the gospel of peace. That most people have never heard. They've heard the words gospel of peace, but they've never had heard the, the doctrine or the theology of the doctrine of the gospel of peace. Because the gospel of peace comes from a covenant of peace. Because God made a covenant of peace, there's the good news of peace. Thus, we're supposed to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And that's why it says in Romans that how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. And that's why Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give with you. That's why in the book of Matthew and Luke and Jesus shows up as a baby the angels are in heaven and they say glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men not between men but toward men from God and man after 400 silent years they weren't scared of the devil in the old covenant they were scared of God mm -hmm. it was God that opened up the ground and swallowed up thousands of people. 23,000 one day. 3,000 the law just first showed up. 3,000 people died. Man. And so those were, so I think we're, we're on the right mark. Let's talk about, can we talk about grace right off the bat? This is going to give you, now, uh, please, we're a small group, but let's interrupt. I mean, if you have a question, uh, Alec can usually answer it. I'll just let you know. <laughs> you can. Yeah. I'll read something up. Yeah, there you go. You're following my lead, see? You just let the Holy Ghost come on out. Uh, turn to me, to, if you have your, your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, this is just a basic understanding of what the Bible says grace is. Now, we talk about the word grace. You have these churches that have grace fellowship, but they usually know nothing about grace. Hey, be careful. No, <laughs> uh -oh. oh, did I just, did I hit something? <laughs> That's just what we're called. 
His, uh, his group is called Grace Fellowship. Oh! <laughs> yeah, but you're starting to understand it. Okay. So, I guess God's moving strong in this whole thing. Chapter, uh, chapter 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow concerning the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 9. Do not be carried, uh, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. And Joyce put this on the board. For it is good that the heart be established by grace. Now I'm just going to stop right there. I'm just going to read. Not with foods which have no profit, as have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Does anybody know what that's talking about? That's about the children of Israel. This is talking to Hebrews. Okay? Under the law. So that has not profited. Oh. I'm moving it a little bit because you're going to be in the way of the word. Ooh, I'm in the way of the word. Don't want to do that. Don't want to be in the way of the word. No. Unless you use a different context. The way. Oh. Uh, come on now. <laughs> So let's read this again. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. Now, some people, see, what I love about this is everybody, when they read this, looks at their own denomination, of the, their own way of thinking, thinking, yeah, see, well, we know it's right, and everybody else is various and strange. Mm -hmm. And that person, that group over there, thinks they're the right ones, and everybody else is various and strange. Yeah. You got one group over here says, well, unless you're part of us, you can't even be saved. You got another, no, you have to be part of us to be saved. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I remember telling the board one time that we had to backslide from your church to, to, to go to their right church. Up, yeah. That's funny right there. Yeah. <laughs> Do not be carried about with very strange doctrines, for it is good that your heart, say your heart, your heart, heart, be established by grace. So that's what we need to have a heart established in, not by law. And what are some other words that we can throw in there other than grace that are thrown in there? How about fear? How many people use fear to have that the fear message makes people their heart is every time they read the Bible they it's, it's fearful. Yeah. I, I love what the scripture says. It, it, it says. I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Did you see that word beseech? That's just a good word. I beseech you. I beg you, I plead with you to have present your bodies as a living sacrifice uh, by the guilt and fear and condemnation of God? No. What's the motivation in this? What is the motivation in us presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice? I beseech you by the mercy of God. A lot of people believe that's, that's not, that's uh, your standards. The mercy is God. It's not us. Put yourself as a body of sacrifice means to live in righteous standards. Right. To follow the rules. Yeah, but but what's the happened. motivation? Punishment for it or mercy? See, you, you, you have what a... Church you the, the whole... <laughs> the what? It's just court what church you're in. Yeah, well, there you go. But see, the old covenant was based out of fear of death. And the scripture says they were in bondage all their lifetime. Matter of fact, since we're in such a small group, Let's just go over to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Joy, we're going to go back to this over here. Let me put my finger there. <clears throat> now, remember the book of Hebrews is written to whom? <clears throat> Hebrews. Inasmuch, verse 14, chapter 2 says, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15. And, this is what he did with his death, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the Jewish people 
all their lifetime fearful of death. And what made that? It's called the law of sin and death. You break the law, you die. Unless there's a sacrifice. So their whole existence was, was based on the fear of death. Man. Wonder why, you know, and we, we're not going to get, we could get into this tonight, but uh, the, there's a story in Scripture, Matthew chapter 17, about, called the, the uh, I've got to change my, i got to go back the way it's called, the Mountain of Transfiguration. Does everybody know that story? It's really the Mountain of what? Transfer. Transfer. It's when Moses and Elijah stood on one side of the mountain, Jesus on the other side, and they transferred authority. The, John chapter John chapter seven uh, John chapter one verse seventeen John one John one seventeen is it says the law, the law came through Moses but grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through so if you got Moses on one side of the mountain and Elijah and you got Jesus on the other side and the law was came, Moses represents the law and just for a little side note look at this. For the law was given through Moses. So in other words, if, if God wanted the people to have something, the law, he gave it to Moses and then he had to translate it to the people, right? But look at this. I'll, I'll get you a second. But grace, grace, everybody say grace. 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 And truth came. It wasn't given. It wasn't given to a... a, a you didn't receive it second hand. Right. See, the children of Israel received it second hand via through Moses, but grace and truth came. He brought Jesus brought it directly to you. No in between. Right. Man, that's powerful. Yeah. yeah. That's personal. Go ahead. Uh, for the benefit of the people watching online, you didn't mean to say that they were on opposite sides of the mountain, did you? Well, they were on top of the mountain. Yeah. But that's the representation because where where was Moses when he received the law? Say a mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where was he now? On a, was he on another mountain? Yeah. So when God does something on a mountain, what do you do? Pay attention! Yeah. So if you have a mountain here, and this is a different mountain, right? Yeah. Your mountain here. What do you call the area in between the two mountains? A valley. A valley. Well, doesn't the scripture say that the law is death? So if the law started here, and the law ended here. This is the, oh, maybe that's why David said, though I walk through the valley of the dispensation of death, the valley of the shadow of death. Because he had a different relation. He had a new covenant relationship and an old covenant dispensation. He had an understanding that no one else had. And he was living in the fear of death. Death reigned. The scripture says death reigned in the time of Moses and the law. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it said, oh, I, yeah, this is called 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I still got my fingers in my fingers. Look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse, verse 7. But the ministry, have, have we done this with everybody here? I know you've done it. Have we done the hands? Okay. But if the ministry of death is written engraved on stones. Okay. So what was the period of time during the, the time when the law was was on earth for the Jews. It was the ministry of death. So when we read this in Hebrews chapter 2. Oh, I just lost my finger. My place. It says, And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to what? Bondage. Oh, Bondage. What verse was that mean? 15. That was, that was 15. And so when you see this, and just for to keep on track here, in the book of Galatians. Before we move on, you want to read 16? You're, you're going to be like Joy, aren't you? She always wants me to keep <laughs> reading. <laughs> no. uh, and release those through the fear. For indeed, those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to what? Bondage. For indeed, he, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Okay. Let's go to Galatians. Real quickly. Galatians chapter 4. We're going to jump over here. Uh, I, I know we've talked about this before, but I've got to do this. 
uh, 21 says, Tell me who desire to be under the law. Do, uh, do you not hear the law? We're talking about the Old Covenant. What verse? 21. 21. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by, uh, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was, uh, was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise. Which things are what? So on my left side over here is going to represent Hagar and Ishmael. That's the symbolicness, okay? On my right side is going to be Sarah and Isaac. Does everybody see that? So these things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants. Is there any argument with how many covenants we're talking about? We're talking about the old covenant. We're talking about the new covenant, right? And it goes on to say, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to what? Bondage. We just read that the children of Israel in bondage all their lifetime, who so said they're afraid of death, and that came through the law of sin and death. You sin, you die, unless there's a sacrifice. It says, Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. So Hagar and Ishmael represent the Old Covenant. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children, even to this day, it says. But the Jerusalem above, okay, is free. Everybody say free. 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 Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I don't know too many religions, I don't know of any religion. Matter of fact, the heavier your religion is, the less Jesus is involved in it. Wow. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Let's just jump down in here. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But he who was born according to the flesh, then he persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. And that's still going on today. Even so, it is now. Nevertheless, one, uh, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Does everybody believe in scripture? Shake your head. Everybody yes, believe in scripture. Yes. The scripture says, cast out the bondwoman. So if you're going to obey Scripture, what are you going to do? And what is the bottom of it? The Old Covenant. So if you're going to be obedient to Scripture, bless God, hallelujah, you're going to stand up and say, I believe this Word of God. And I believe it. Don't get me wrong. But it says for us that are born of the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, to cast out the old, old covenant and live in the new covenant. It says it right there. For the scripture says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman will not be heir with the son of the free. And I, we, one of our favorite things to point out to people is how many times we're, we're married, we're new covenant believers, but we have old covenant mindsets. The church usually knows more about the word of God in history than the word of God in mystery that was given to the Gentiles through Paul. And here's verse 31. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but children of the free. 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 So if you're children of the free, what are we supposed to do according to Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman. Bond, bond bond Don't live under the old covenant. Romans chapter, I know we've done this, I just got to say it again. I, and maybe Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Now, Rome was full of Gentile believers and Jewish believers that have been. Jewish people have been converted to Christianity. So in other words, they were under a strict, re religious, hard, fearful, God judging. They were scary God. I mean, you can't get that past your, past your head here. But they had been born again. But they had a mindset. Or do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law. Gentiles didn't know the law. He's focusing on the Jewish people in the congregation that knew the law. That the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called a what? Adulteress. Adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law 
that law so that she is not an adulteress. Next time you have communion, I want you to do chapter four, uh, verse 4 here. <coughs> Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead. Now, what, what's the brethren? Well, everybody was his brethren, but which brethren is he talking to? The ones who understand the law. The ones that were Jews that had been under the law of Moses. Therefore, my brethren, talking to those that knew the law, you also have become dead to the law through the body. Next time you have communion, it says, do this in remembrance of me. You get that wafer, that bread, that matzah, the cracker. You say, thank you, Jesus, that through your body, I am dead to the law of Moses. That's good. And you usually say it's for sin. Oh, yeah. Come on. Exactly. I got eight verses that have changed the way you do communion. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about grace. No, we're talking about grace tonight. <laughs> Unless you ask me those eight verses. <laughs> <laughs> Through the body of Christ that you may be what? Married. To another. To him who was raised from the dead. Why? That we should bear fruit to God. See, the problem is we're new covenant believers living under another man's law. And that's called spiritual adultery. No wonder we're not bearing fruit. No more we're not receiving the joy and the freedom of the relationship that we're supposed to be in. Because we're mixing the law with grace. Because the old covenant is law, and it's a new covenant of grace. Grace, that's what we teach grace, peace, Christ, righteousness, and the finished work of Calvary. That's what we teach. We just don't teach grace. You know, the Bible says that there is a true grace. Well, if there's a true grace, there's a... Well, yeah. So there's a true grace we must understand. We teach grace, the gospel of peace. We teach everything that's about Christ's righteousness and everything that was done into the finished work of Calvary. And I believe that is what Paul received. I'm not Calvinist. I'm not Arminian. I'm Paulist. Is it? I'm a Paulism. Much, is it too much to ask what is the false grace? Example. Oh, for sure. It's the, uh, uh, the the scripture literally says that they frustrated the grace of God. Okay, a false grace is when you use grace for selfish living. When you go outside, this we we can get into that here in a second. Okay, since we're talking about grace, so let's go back to Hebrews chapter thirteen. And I'll, I'll say that a little better in a second, Barry. No, I won't. I'll do it now. Uh, a false grace. Everybody knows what doctrine is. Every group of people have a different doctrine. Yeah. They have a different theological uh, concept of God's word and God and everything. So, Articles of faith. Yeah, it's all well. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, we call those fence laws. You know that. Okay. And everybody's got their own laws they add to it. You know, to make them different. Well, they. Anyway, 150 different kinds of Baptist churches, you know what I'm saying? What can I say? Okay. Uh, the difference in theology, the difference in doctrine than truth. Remember, we taught the first time, I think the first meeting, we had the difference between text and truth. Okay? See, text is theology, you know, the doctrine is the, the text. And you can have the text right. You can other other groups going to have the other the same text, and then they're going to be different than you mm -hmm. you have, right? Yep. But you can't argue truth. Now, just because you're told something's truth doesn't mean it's true. Right. Right. But the truth will set you free, not make you defensive. Why are you looking at me? No, I'm not just. I'm, not, <laughs> no, I'm looking around. Do you take it personal? <laughs> Well, there's only one, two, three, four. I mean, how many? I've got to pick on everybody at least once. Why'd you take that so defensive? <laughs> I guess you took it defensive. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, the, like the grace message. When you hear what the grace is, the grace of God according to Scripture, you'll say, well, yeah, that makes sense. But most people have the doctrine of grace in their head. But when you experience the power of grace... See, people, people that say, well, grace, 
Oh, I've got, you, oh, they've got a license to sin. You don't need a license to sin. You sin before you had a license. You know, grace doesn't right. free you to sin. It gives you right. the empowered over. It gives you empowerment to overcome it. Right. So frustrating the grace of God is not using the power that grace is supposed to be given to you to overcome the sin that you couldn't overcome in the flesh. And you're using the doctor and say, I'm free, I'm free. And you go out and live in the flesh. Right. The scripture literally says it this way. Don't let your liberty... Be an occasion for your flesh. Right. See? And so that's what we're, you know, that's why I want to make sure everybody understands what, what we believe grace is. Because information will just inform you. Revelation will empower you. And until you get the revelation of grace, it really won't be in your heart. Right. It'll just be in your head. It's like salvation. Just because you said the words, Jesus saved me, confess it. Oh, your Lord doesn't mean you said it from your heart. And you've got to deal with that. Just because someone says Jesus is Lord, are they saved? That's way beyond our pay grade, isn't it? Yeah. But the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, heart not your head. Right. Americans have a tendency to separate faith and actions. That you can believe but not walk in the actions. You can't do that in Jewish culture. They're one and the same. Okay? We won't get into that. Let's go on. So, Hebrews chapter 13. It says, it's good to have your what? What, what verse? Your heart established. Verse 9. Do not be carried away. Uh, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. So, what this is saying, the only doctrine that's not strange is the doctrine of grace. So every other doctrine that is not founded on grace mm -hmm. is strange. Oh, don't hear that preach very often, but that's what it says. It says, do not be carried about with various strange doctrines. For it is good that your heart be established on the doctrine, the foundation of of grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have uh, been occupied by them. Look at verse 10. We, who's the we? Those that are believing in Christ that have their heart established in grace. Mm -hmm. We have an altar. This is so powerful. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to to eat. What tabernacle are we talking about? The Old Covenant. Those that serve the Old Covenant have no right to eat. From what, what, what? At the altar was the most personal thing in the entire Old Covenant. And we have an altar that we can eat from that they have no right to because they're under the law. We're, we're family. Well, that's something you can't, this is good stuff. We have an altar from those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is, is uh, brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned in the outside the camp. Je Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people uh, with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him. What's it mean outside the camp, outside the gate, bearing his reproach? If Jesus would have died inside the city, we'd all be Jews. If he had been sacrificed inside, but he was sacrificed where? Yeah. Outside religion. Yeah, think about that one. Come on. <laughs> he was a sacrifice. In, and we're coming up to resurrection season. Let me, let me make this little commercial. What's the date we're going to do it? Um, I believe it's 23rd. Let me... I believe you're right. 23rd of... Uh, 23rd of March. Of the March. Uh, we're going to be teaching. It's a five-hour teaching, but we break in the middle for... Uh, for brisket. For brisket. Or uh, mm -hmm. barbecue. And we do a five-hour teaching on the resurrection season and everything that, everything that we know of as today that took place where Jesus fulfilled, when it says he fulfilled the law, we have no idea. 
how many things he fulfilled. For just a little commercial, in the Talmud, uh, there, there are several books that the, the Jews have as records. You have the T Talmud, the Mishnah, the Midrash, and a couple other, but those are the three main ones that give more about the Jewish culture and history than what we have in the Bible. You know, they don't contradict, they add to, okay? And I've got a theory. If you can read something from some other writing that, that adds to this, that magnifies this, that's in agreement with this, read it. Now, it's not inspired, but if it helps you understand the, the stories, read it. If it contradicts this, shock it. Just don't even throw it away. But the Talmud, the Mishnah, uh, they literally said that, that the Jewish people every year would take the Passover lamb that was selected and they would inspect it. The first step of inspection is to inspect its hooves, you know, its feet. And it says six days before the Passover, take spikenard and rub the feet of the hooves to indicate that this is the start of the inspection process six days before the Passover. Well, six days before the Passover, in John chapter 12, it says that Jesus was having dinner, and this lady walks in six days before the Passover, takes a bottle of spikenard, and anoints his feet with oil. Some of us believe that the first drop that hit the sheep's hooves, the first drop hit Jesus' feet at the exact same moment in time. And that wouldn't be that much if that was just the only one, but in Mark chapter 14, it says that two days before the Passover, a lady comes in, Jesus is having dinner, and anoints his head with spike nard. Yeah, you know the story. Guess what the Talmud and the Mishnah say? Two days before the Passover, the Passover lamb, once it's inspected, its head is anointed with oil to show it's a perfect sacrifice. Some people believe like I believe, the moment the first drop of oil hit Jesus' head was the same time when the lamb was being anointed. We go through the whole process that takes four straight hours. I will tell you it starts at 3 o'clock and we have worship first. So he will probably start about 3.30ish. And the reason I'm saying watch it live if you want to watch because we show some videos that usually get blanked out. Get banned from Facebook okay. because they're copyrighted laws. But they can't block it out when it's just live. And we encourage people to go eat, go buy some barbecue and wait till we eat and then eat with, you know, shut up, eat barbecue with us and uh -huh. be part of the family. Uh -huh. You know, and watch it. But, you know, when, when the priest takes the knife and cuts the throat of the Passover lamb, he says, it is finished. Been that for hundreds of years. And Jesus, I believe Jesus at the same time said, it is yes. Okay, Grace. It's full. Cool. Let's go back to Grace. All right. So, turn with me to Second Corinthians, chapter twelve. Second Corinthians, chapter twelve, verse nine. That's here. Second Corinthians. What did I say? I should just turn around, but that's all right. Verse 9. Well, let's go to verse 7. And lest I should, should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations of a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord, how many times? Three times. That I might, uh, that it may depart from me. Verse 9. And he said to me, my grace, now whose grace is it? Jesus' grace. And he's speaking to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. And now he's going to describe his grace. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Jesus is describing his grace that we're supposed to be founded on in our heart as his strength. 
It is the strength of Jesus working in our life. To do what? To walk through, overcome, and deal with the things of this world. We, 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 our heart needs to be, it's not about me doing it. It's about me letting the strength of Jesus work in me. Does everybody understand it? Turn to first Peter chapter four, first Peter chapter four. Verse 10. Now let's go to eight. Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks about. First Peter four. First Peter 5, verse, okay. First Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are uh, experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his glory well I'll keep going they called us to his glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while perfect establish strengthen and settle you to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever let me read that again but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ after you suffered a while perfect, establish, strengthen, and what? So what does grace do? Let me read it again. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. Wow. See, it doesn't a false grace will tell you to go out and do what you want to do. But a true grace will what? Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. Man, that's, that's a whole lot of difference. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. 1 But by the grace of God, I am, this is Paul speaking, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but what? The grace of God, which was with me. So it's the grace of God. It's God's ability to, the definition of grace that you need to hear in all this is God's ability and your inability. Now, we can talk about unmerited favor, but that's a very shallow. How do you apply that in your life? That's all I heard all my life. God's unmerited. Unmerited favor. Well, go to work and apply that. How do you apply unmerited favor? You know, now I can show you a biblical story. As a matter of fact, let's do that. Everybody know the story of Christmas? A little girl named Mary. You know what the, you know what the scripture says about Mary. She said she was greatly afraid. It says when the angel showed up, let's turn it real quick. Luke chapter, chapter two, chapter one. This is a perfect example of our life in story form. Luke chapter one, we're gonna skip down a few things. I was saying, verse 27, he approaches Mary. In verse 28, he says, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But she, what? But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Did she really hear what he said? Or was she troubled what kind of greeting it was? Well, the next verse. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. So she's afraid in her heart and she hasn't been able to hear what the angel has said. What message do we get from this? As long as you have fear in your heart, you won't hear the true word of God. Have you seen some of those angels? 
Do what? You've seen some of those angels. I'd probably be afraid too. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it just looked like a man to her. Oh, wow. It wasn't, uh, didn't have great big wings. You know, this is just, see, what? see in, the Jewish, in the Jewish culture, a man wouldn't even walk up to a, a 13 year old girl that he didn't know and start talking to her. <coughs> and even if there was, there are usually other men around, and there was a way. This broke all the culture stigmas of the time. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found what? What's the basic understanding of the word of the, the grace, the word grace? Unmerited? Oh, it was the grace message that took the fear out of her heart. The angel told her that she had favor. Wait a minute. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Why? You have favor with God. So what's going to take the fear out of our hearts? The grace message. The very essence of the understanding of I don't deserve anything, but he's count, he gives it to me anyway. You, do you deserve salvation? No. But by grace, you've been saved through faith. And that's the essence of our, that's our foundation of our faith is grace. Man, did you, someone have a question? Someone? Okay. Then the angel said to her, do not fear, do not be afraid. Mary, for you have, how do we know she had fear in her heart? It says it right there. Next verse. And behold, you will conceive. Now she's hearing the word. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and you uh, shall call his name Jesus. Next verse. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel. She just heard all that. How can this be? Why? She's a little bitty girl in a little bitty place with a little bitty vision. The only thing she'd ever thought about doing, most girls at that age only thought about having a male child at some day, being married with a male child. That was fulfillment of life. Yeah. Question. When the angel first came in, he said, Greetings, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. She was still under the law, so she was probably afraid of God, wasn't she? Well, she was afraid of the greeting and the type of greeting it was, because that's what it says. But if he said, God is yeah. with you... Yeah. And so grace came in to take away the fear. Okay? Yes. And Mary said, to him, How can this be since I do not know a man? Now she didn't deny this, but she's questioning. It's okay to question what God's doing in your life. And the angel said to her, said, Well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One uh, is to be born, will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, I love this part, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, a miraculous miracle conception. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, here it is, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Now, she just didn't see herself as the maidservant of the Lord at the beginning, did she? Just a little big girl, a little big place, a little town called Bethlehem. Or Nazareth. Wow. So her her mind has changed to something. Now the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your word. See, once grace and blessing. The grace message came and said, Hey, you're blessed among women. You're you're you found faith with God. You're blessed. Grace, you have grace and blessing. The message of grace and blessing got her to see that she was blessed and changed her mentality about herself. And now she said, whatever you say about me, I receive it. Isn't that the way we're supposed to be? That when we hear the word of God, even though it doesn't fit our history, even though it doesn't fit our culture, even though it doesn't fit the, the, the little visions we've had in our life, God called her to a bigger vision. And she said, be it unto me. Whatever your word says about us will be that. Now, if you're still living under the old covenant, you got a problem with that. But if you're living under the new covenant, you'll receive that. Because the truest thing about you is what God says about you. Okay? Is there, yes. In today's society with our youth, 
they have a hard time understanding the concept of grace. And they relate grace probably better if it's used in love. Uh, and I know they, they probably don't understand love completely, but love and fear and grace, grace is of the least that they probably have understanding. Uh, well, that's because we live in a world of works. We do. It's work, you know, Solid. how many felt that really good about yourself when you got an F on a test? I felt good when I got a D because I usually got the F's. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. That was a good day for me. <laughs> because we live in a performance-based society. Yeah. And our churches are performance-based. Mm -hmm. What was the first temptation of Jesus Christ? Don't say it unless you know it. Just let them think. <laughs> Turn the rock into bread, right? No. It was if you be the Son of God, turn the stones into bread. The first temptation was to prove who you were by what you do. <gasps> what did Jesus say? Man's not going to live by his performance. He's going to live by the, by the word of God. What did he just hear? This is my beloved son. Well, oh, please. See, the, all the devil's got to do is get you to see you according to your works. And you'll never live the life you're supposed to live. That's Greece fear. Go ahead. I want to ask a question kind of relative to what Brother Mary was talking about at first. What What are your thoughts? Uh, I know in some of your teachings you spoke about the application of the blood. Because like Brother Larry, we were, we were taught growing up, you had to repent. You got a little bit of grace there. Then you had to be baptized mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus only. Mm -hmm. Right. You got a little grace there. And then you had to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave it. Then, then yeah. you were saved. You were born saved. again. So basically, mm -hmm. we were taught the application of grace only came until you talked in tongues like a Chinese laundry, you know, down there at the altar. <laughs> or speaking in tongues. But well, you got it. You're saved now. Uh -huh. Yeah. What are your What are your thoughts on the application when a person? Because Paul says in Ephesians that we're, for by grace we're saved through faith, and I had to come to that and understand on my own, right? Searching to realize right. that grace was applied to Timothy Tynan when he acted in faith for Jesus Christ. What are your What are your thoughts on that that could help us in talking to different ones? Because I talk to them all the time that ask me about where I came from. Why I've changed my thoughts on salvation. Okay. There's a subject in seminaries called soteriology. Right. Okay. Of salvation, right. You know, uh, this is a verse that, if you if turn to, Joy so put uh, uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 on the board. Titus. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of. Righteousness. No, it doesn't say unrighteousness. It's just right. not, not works of what? Righteousness. Is being baptized a good thing to do? <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking in tongues is a good thing to do. Is saying a prayer a good thing to do? Absolutely. Is repenting a good thing to do? Absolutely. But watch this. They're all works of righteousness. You realize righteousness is not moral or ethical behavior. It's not a doing. And it's not a not doing. It's a right standing with the Father that produces a moral and ethical behavior. It's called the fruit of righteousness. Righteousness is what, I, I tell this all the time on purpose just to get people to go, what? You don't need to be saved to go to heaven. If you understand what salvation is, you need to be righteous. You need to be, have the Spirit of God inside of you. You have to be regenerated. You got that? It's what? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. Not fear, not judgment, but according to his mercy. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not you didn't do something to get saved. 
You believed. Yes. And I can show you that in the scripture here shortly if you want to do it. I can show you where in the book of Acts there's a certain formula that they follow. So and you know what I'm talking about. Acts chapter 10. There's a certain formula. But I take you over to John, I mean Acts chapter 10 and that blows that formula out of the water. They, they don't mention the word repent. <laughs> they believe and they start speaking in the tongues. Yeah. Right. Then they get baptized. Yeah. Right. They just believe. That was all they did. You know, that's I mean, they did. Right. You know, so that's what I'm saying. It's not... See, there's, a, there's also a group of people out there called what we call water gospel. That they believe that you're not saved until you get water baptized. That that's what saves you. Well, is it a work? Yeah, it's a work. But it's, it's not the water that regenerates you. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not the speaking in tongues. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not. It's the, it's the regeneration. And you're renewing. Getting rid of the old man and putting on the new. Is the work of the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe. That new man is created on the inside of you. It's no longer you that live with Christ. It is on the inside of you. Yes. Basically but that's where they would take you to the uh -huh. speaking in tongues is the Holy Spirit. Right? It, it is. Take you back to Acts 2. That, that's fine. Yeah. That's, that's great. And I have no problem with speaking in tongues, tongue, but that's not... It can... You realize people can speak in tongues that aren't saved? Absolutely. Yeah. So why is that a sign of salvation? Oh! Ask the oh. Ask everybody. <laughs> oh, what? That's where we came from. I, I understand. But ask everybody that, if speaking in tongues is a sign of salvation, people that speak in tongues that aren't saved, and they tell you they're not saved. I argued that point before. Thank you. So you know what I'm talking about. See, what we do, see, many will do this, many will cast out demons. Is that a good thing to do? Many will do these things. But in that day, they'll come to me and say, Lord, Lord, uh -huh. I never knew you. Uh -huh. It's not about the things you can do. And I know you know that. I'm just, uh -huh. I'm getting passionate. It's about our believing in what he did. See, sin, most religions are focused on sin, not on him. Mm -hmm. I believe if we focus on him, we won't sin. Right. It's that simple. Yeah. If you see sin, you're going to do sin. I ask people, well, how many sinners saved by grace? You know, your hands go up? All of them. I said, no, you're not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner saved by grace. Let, let, let me go ahead and finish this, this short teaching on grace. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to you, uh, given to me for you, how that by revelation, say revelation. Revelation. It's got to come by revelation. You can't just take a test and understand certain scriptures. You've got to have a test and think you've got grace. That's theory. That's theology. But you can know all the theology that you think you know and not have it. You can know the text and not the truth. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. As I have briefly written already. By which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Which in other ages. Say other ages. Which in other ages was not. Say the Old, Code, say the Old Testament. Okay. All the way back. Okay. Listen. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. What was it made known? Grace. Grace, the mystery. Huh. As it has now been revealed by the Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. So there's a message of grace that they didn't know about under the law. And it goes back to the Scripture. This dispensation of grace. This dispensation of grace. Because we're in the dispensation of grace, not any other dispensation. That's right. And people try to mix those. The covenants. Right. And that's my job is try to convince people through scripture to show them that everywhere in the Bible, everywhere, is an example of a total separation. Not a mixture, but a total separation. Yes. Matter of fact, uh, Joe, we've got to do this real quick. Hebrews 17, we talked about this. 
And before you go there, yeah. on dispensation, there was a dispensation of conscience. Yes. Before law. Right. That's what Abraham was. That's about. right. That's and right. so people don't understand conscious dispensation. Let's see. You've got to remember that Abraham was a Gentile. That hurts people a lot, too. <laughs> wow. Isaac. I mean, you got to think about it. When did the law come? With Moses. That's when God separated the people of Israel out of the Gentile world. Those that, sandwiches that, will be there when you're done. Is oh. that meant to be? <laughs> well, <they laughs> say, was, that <laughs> was that meant to be? What, 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 that way. What, 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 what's that? I mean, the law. Was it meant to be that way? What Abraham <laughs> being a Gentile? <laughs> until until we've heard that the law was that? added because man wanted it to be added, and it was not intended for it to be part of the. The journey of God, our creation. No, no. The story of the law is much simpler than that. Uh, the Gentile world has always been. I've actually heard people think that Adam was a Jew. Come on. That he was Everybody Hebrew. was Gentile. Uh, everybody was Gentile. The whole world is Gentile. And we're not going to get, we can't go there. But everybody was Gentile and still is. And out of this Gentile world, he pulled a small group of people out and called them Hebrew. When they went into bondage, they went in as a family, a large tribe. What, 72? 70 to 75. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 72 and a half then. Okay. I'll get there. <laughs> 72 and a half. 72 and a half. <laughs> they go into bondage and they come out as a nation. There's millions. Yeah. So for a family, or a, a family group doesn't need bylaws and constitutions but a nation does for them to become an organized nation and literally what it is is God has always wanted a group of people to live in a way that would bring him glory but if he wouldn't have put brought them into the law the Bible literally says that there wouldn't have been a seed remain that we'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah so in other words in simplicity for there to be a virgin on earth that the Messiah could come from that was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. For a virgin to remain, inside more, there's no virgins. As soon as the girl became, matter of fact, they never even, they were molested before they even became of age. Okay? So for there to be a virgin, there had to be a group of people that would carry a law that would fear God in a way that would honor the, the and this is in simplicity, the so there'd be a virgin so the Messiah could come in due season. And the law was a taskmaster until Jesus comes. Now that Jesus came, that law is done away with. But if it wasn't for the law, there wouldn't have been a virgin for the Messiah. That's in simple form. Simple form. Mm -hmm. Because the whole world has been proven, the whole world was corrupt and would be corrupted again if there wasn't a group of people that would carry the awe of God with them. When I say the awe of God, I mean the reverence. Not just the, oh, no, but the reverence for his will and his ways. And so he gave, made a nation that would be his people, his special people. He was always with them. The rest of the world still lived under these laws. We won't even get into that. And so when the Messiah came from a virgin, Jesus came as a baby, the virgin, fulfilled all this law that he gave, then that law was done away with and we're not living under that. Perfect. This was the law of sin and death. Why are we still wanting to live under the law of sin and death? I don't understand that. You know, the Bible says over here, kill your enemies. Over here it says love your enemies. What do we do? We love to kill our enemies. Stop it. <laughs> we're missing the boat. Then to answer your question, the law had to come. And that's a simple explanation. Much deeper than that, but that's a simple explanation of why the purpose of the law was. I mean, there's a story where uh, two angels came down and all the men of, was at uh, Sodom wanted to have sex with the angels. Mm -hmm. Angels were going to be corrupted. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Everything was corrupted. Animals were corrupted. What happened before the flood? Everything was corrupted. Mm -hmm. the, the, the angels came down, the fallen angels, they came down, 
had sex with the, the daughters of men, made the Nephilim, just not that, but they perverted the animal. The, the, the animals. It was a mess. And that would have continued if there wouldn't have been a group of people that would have that awe and reverence of God to honor his word and his wow. will. To, so a virgin, so the Messiah could come. Right. Man, that's, that's as simple as I can make it. Yeah, it was on purpose. No. Okay. So it's good to have your heart established. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Let's do this real quick. Just show you. Uh, I don't think we... Maybe... Did, I don't know. If I've shared this, let me know. I, I forget. Now, I don't know if we'll do the whole thing. But now, after six days... Did we talk about this before? Mm -hmm. We did shake your head if you've heard this? Okay. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John... <laughs> Just got a little revelation today, too. And after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. His brother led him up to life. What comes after six? Seven. How many days of creation is there? Six. Seven. But God rested on the seventh, so there's six days of works, one day of rest. So after six days of work, what's the next day? So this is happening. In other words, Moses and Elijah represent the period of works. Wow. The period of the law. Jesus represents the day of what? Rest. Rest. Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Brother led them up to a high mountain uh, by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. And his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophet. Jesus represents grace and truth. Right? Yeah. Then Peter and Answer said, Lord, let us, uh, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. So either they're bringing Jesus up to the level of the law and the prophets, or they're bringing the law and the prophets up to the level of Jesus. But God steps in the conversation mm -hmm. while he was still speaking. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. In whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, not them. That's a powerful revelation. Now, for the sake of time, let's go over to. Uh, oh, let's just go ahead and read it. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but. Jesus. Because the law of the prophet had gone from this earth. They're no, no longer in this dimension. Mm -hmm. But, okay. Uh, now as they came down from the mountain, this is the point I want to get at, Jesus commanded them saying, tell, they just heard from God and they're going not to tell somebody. <laughs> tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen. What does that indicate from the dead? The new covenant. Right. So now this truth of just hearing Jesus starts at the resurrection. Right. The truth is at the resurrection is the end or Calvary. When he said it is finished, he didn't say I am. He said it is. The old covenant came to an end. Moses and Elijah existed in authority until the Calvary. And at the resurrection, a new covenant was established. How can you argue with that? Cast out the bond woman. It's over for the old. The scripture literally says that Jesus came to do the will of the Father to get rid of the first and establish the second. And he did. And what do we do? Oh, we bring it back. People know more of the old covenant than they do the new covenant. Because they're afraid that man cannot live for God without regulation. I think, man, I think it's a little deeper than that. I think there's people that want to control people. Well, that's true. And they'll put you under law to do it. Yeah. But it, I always compare it to, to marriage. Yes. You know, people say, well, that's commendable that Pam and I have been married 50 years. Or it's kept you married for 50 years. But it definitely wasn't our marriage certificate. Right. 
Exactly. I haven't ever even seen the marriage certificate in 30 years. So you could be off the hook. Yeah. So that law, that whoever that law was, or whatever that marriage certificate represented, I had no earthly idea. Because right. it's not Never part of our marriage. Yeah. But what it has kept work. us is the love we have for one another. That's right. right. Yeah. And, and the mercy that we share one to one another. Yeah. You know, given mercy there when when you could be right but you go to let her have her way a little bit you know here get some mercy you know <laughs> a little bit oh oh she almost rebuked you on that one <laughs> but what i'm trying to get to you is it's a relationship that's right and and people don't have relationships with jesus and that's where they even fail but that's pam right. pam will tell the story a lot of times that before she became truly in, knew the love of God, because she was living under fear, you can't know love if you're under fear. You can't get close to And there are a lot of women that go right back into a marriage that's right. abusive yeah. because they think they have to have fear to be in a marriage. Yeah. Okay. They don't think they can be in a marriage of pure love. Mm -hmm. And so people will go back into a relationship yeah. with God under fear. Yes. And try to live under the fear factor. Yep. And that's and, and then they can't understand how we can live under the grace factor when we when they have to have the fear factor. Right. It's all about relationship. They'll tell, they'll tell you they're not afraid. And they'll tell you they're not in bondage. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. they are. But you, anybody can look at them and see that they are. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I've been, you, you've just come out of, or not just, but... You can look back and go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much bondage I was in. I was a dumb guy. And, and I've, I've talked to me. I've counseled with oh, people yeah. that's been in bad marriages. And they'll they'll sit there and swear to you that they weren't in an abusive marriage. But why do you have the black eyes? Right. Why do you have the cuts? Why have you been very true? You know, well, I did something wrong. Yeah. Uh, they deserve it. Fault. They yeah. deserve it. Yeah. I deserve no, it. That's what they think. They, most people, their their identity of themselves is so low, mm -hmm. they don't realize how valuable they are. You know, uh, and so one person will. Here's a theory, not a theory. This is a process. The way you leave a relationship is how you enter the next one. Hurt people. Hurt people. Yeah. If if you leave a church this way, you're going to enter the church this way. I, I don't know too many people. Uh, if a person has been wounded by a mate over here and they get married to another mate over here, they hold this new mate responsible for the way the old mate, not even on purpose, but it's like they have a wounded heart and they are sensitive. So the first time something happens to touch that wound, but see, that's why Jesus came to heal the broken hearted. They're supposed to be healed. And that's why we do our teachings on heart physics that we did up at the church for the, the first few months we were there to get people's hearts healed. Because you can't, as long as you have a fear-based relationship out of low value and self-esteem, you'll always enter that relationship again. You know, usually women that uh, think they're no good or stay in an abusive relationship and they leave that abusive relationship and enter another one. And it's just a continue because they don't see the value and dignity that God sees in them. And that's why we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. You know, we need to get our value and dignity from what this says, just like Jesus said, man's going to live by the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. So grace is really, grace can be put into a word that it's really a relationship. Yeah. Grace is God's ability. A relationship of love. Paul said, his grace is sufficient for me. I don't have the ability, but through him, I, Paul said, I do more works than all the other apostles. Why? Because of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he says it this way, I know in whom mm -hmm. I have believed. Not what? And see, that's what you're talking about. There's a, mm -hmm. a personal, the, 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 there's a, a Greek word called gnosko. Uh, it's the same word as in Hebrew called yada. In uh, Genesis 4.1, Adam knew Eve. Adam yachted Eve. They had such a close relationship. There was intimate, personal relationship. Absolutely. And it's the same word in Greek called gnosko. 
and says, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. I never had an intimate, personal work. That's hard. Mm. That's hard. And so every time you see the word no, it's talking about a a, a, a reality of an experience. Or that's an experience why, that's a reality. Yes. They could do it as a word. They could cast out yeah. demons as a word, but they didn't. I never could know skill to you. Yeah. They knew it up here, mm -hmm. but they didn't know it here. Yeah. And can I just say too, yeah. you, sure. I, lo I love you talking about love so much, Larry, because Jesus was telling Nicodemus, you know, it's because God so loved the world, he gave, right? Mm -hmm. And it says in the word, that God is love. He might have wrath, he might have judgment, but he is love. And if we don't have a love relationship with God, we really don't know him. But when we are allowing his love to flow in me and, and allowing myself to fall in love with him, mm -hmm. like you said, then I'm not going to want to do anything but, unrighteous. Right. But like those unrighteous things might come my way. And what? But, you know, mm -hmm. Papa, I love you. I don't want to do that. Yeah. So many people think that love is works. You know, like we have to prove that comes from the churches. Yeah. A lot of the churches. Yeah. yeah. But with the if the churches are beating you over the head with the law all the time oh, yeah. and making you aware of how you fail yeah. all the time. Oh yeah. You're focused on yourself. Yep. Yeah. You can't sure. have a relationship yeah. with God because you're always looking at yourself. Always. And saying, well, I screwed up again. I gotta repent. I gotta yeah. pray, you know, and, and maybe yeah. he'll forgive me. And he's already forgiven us. And then you're the focus and he's yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. We focus sin's not the problem, it's the issue. Yeah. If we the more we focused on sin, the less we're focused on him. Yeah. The more we're focused on him, the less we're gonna sin. The less we focus on ourselves. Yeah. There's yeah. things that Pam does for me that they think, well, she's your she just laid it to you because she, and I said, I never asked her to do it. And you don't order her to do it. But she does it because she wants to love me. I mean, she loves me. She just wants to show love. And she, and likewise, then I had to turn around and, and retaliate back with love as well. You know, it's, it's not that, and that's not because she had to get love for me to receive love for me. It's just that, it's just something that we just become a second nature to you. You just want to do it. You show your love but be from your appreciation of her love. That's right. And that's the way it should be with us and God. Mm -hmm. Like you teach God, uh, the new, the old covenant was reactive. Uh, we, uh, we would do something and then God, God would spotted. move. Now under the new covenant, God's done everything and, or he'll do for us and then out of uh, appreciation and love for him, yeah. we do, we live righteously in, in his righteousness. But a lot of kids come out of families that, that they seen where their mother had to be a slave to the father and they don't want to ever have to be in that kind of relationship. And they see that. And so they don't know it's hard for them to even know what real sure. love There's is. There's no example. Yeah. And and I, Pam can testify to this. When I was younger, even after we got married, I would ask her the question. I said, I still don't know what love is. Even though I love you and I, I love this, I love my mom, I love my dad, I love, but I still don't understand the concept of love. And it was hard to understand the concept of love and, and I think that's where a lot of people are, is they don't truly understand the concept of love. Right. We get it mixed up with Hollywood. Yes. Hollywood, love is not, you know, uh -huh. roses and... Uh -huh. Well, we understand the acts of love, and, and, and so we're, but we don't understand... And the reason why we don't understand is because we don't have the relationship with God that we should have had. You know, we had the fear, and believe me, in my early years of walking with the Lord, I feared Him greatly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I lived in fear. Sure. But you didn't want to be close. But the church put that on you, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, you're taught it. I taught it. That's our big it's problem. That We've got to unlearn all that stuff. It's that performance based Christianity yeah. that comes from performance based humanism. Yeah. 
It's you're, you're judged on your performance. We were blessed to have this understanding when we were raising our children. I never told my son that he was a bad boy for what he did. He's a, you're a good boy. You did a bad thing. Now right. here's the consequence. Bend right. over. Right. But we never told his nature that he was bad mm -hmm. because of what he did. Yeah. That's what the church would do. You're a sinner because of what you did. No, I'm a saint that has a sin problem. Can you help me overcome it? Mm. Why don't we do that in church? You know, Jesus, the adulterous lady, brought to him in the temple. Uh, he didn't ask her, did you do it? He said, where's your accusers? And she said, there are not. He said, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. The church would say, go and sin no more, and we're not going to accuse you. Well, that's easy. But Jesus said, I don't accuse you, so go and sin no more. Okay. He showed her love. It was like the freedom, the ability, the power to not sin anymore came from the grace that was given to her. Oh, you don't hear that in church. Mm -mm. Mm. Wow. Good comments, good stuff. I love it. Come on, more people. Bring something up. Talk. By the way, the old covenant, like you're talking about, let's, let's talk about tithing or giving. You know, some people believe you give to get. We come from that school, give to get. I hate that concept. Yeah. I, don't, shame you give right I don't give to get. I give because it's first been given. The old covenant, you give to get. In the New Covenant, you, you give because it's been given. In the Old Covenant, you, it was yours. And you gave 10% of what is yours. In the New Covenant, it's all His. Yes. And you're just being a good steward and realizing He gave it to you. Now you're going to give it back. You're keeping the cycle going. But you're not doing it to get it. You're, a, a son doesn't serve the father's business to get his daily bread. A servant serves to get its daily bread. The prodigal son did not come back to be a son. He came back to be a servant to get his daily portion. Man. The other son, I love it. The other son, all these years, I've obeyed your commandments. And you've never done that for me. Give him a party, right? What did he do? He obeyed the commandments. What did the son say? What did the father say? All these years, it's always been yours to have. But he always was focused on doing the commandments. Mm -hmm. See, the story is not about two sons. The story is about a father who had two sons that didn't understand their relationship with the father. Mm -hmm. Sounds That's like church, true. doesn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. You brought up tithing, so to for a pastor or any leader to teach tithing as an absolute requirement to leadership and all that, wouldn't that be under the law? Living under the law? Absolutely, it's a curse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I agree. Yeah, if it's not done, it, you know, it's not a. Uh, they always go. Yeah, that's all under the old code. But they'll, but they'll be the first to tell you. These same churches said, "We're not under the law of Moses. We're yeah. not under the law of right. Moses." Right. Well, yet, they, back. they teach that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it takes that to keep the doors open and keep Larry, the doors open. Larry and I, before we left, we were told we would be cursed. Yeah, <laughs> we would be cursed. Those words were told to us. Yeah. We will be cursed. If you do if not, you not give whatever way. Yes. Wow. That we would be cursed. And if First time did, that's ever been told And as a minister, if you ever. had a savings account, yeah. and, and you were saving, and not put it back into the work of God, then you are stealing from God. Wow. I appreciate the church in the foyer. They put the non tithers on a list. That's true. You went wow. in, there was a list of people wow. that said non tithers. That is total condemnation. Wow. Yeah. And then people still go there. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand. Really? Can I read the scripture? Uh, yeah, read it, brother. I believe in giving. Sure, absolutely. And if you want to, you got to remember, we're taking this old mindset out of the world and trying to bring it, and everything in the kingdom is opposite. To live, you have to die. That doesn't make sense to the world. But everything's opposite, okay? 
address. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 17, hmm. verse 24. We'll just start with it. Maybe you haven't seen this applied to tithing yet. Got a question. How many people born again in the room today? Born again. Regenerated by the Holy Ghost, whether you've been baptized or not. When they had come into Capernaum, and because of that, you are, are you a, a, a sinner or a, are you a child of God? Child. You're a child of God. And that's called a son or daughter, right? Right. Okay. When they had come into Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Now remember, they're under the old covenant right now. He said, Yes! And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take custom or taxes? Is it custom to pay your tithes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said, From strangers. And Jesus said to him, and the, sons and the sons are free. The sons do what they do to support the father's business. I've heard it said that if you, if you quit push, pushing your tax or your tithes, there wouldn't be any money to run the church. You mean to pay a salary? Yeah. Show me guaranteed salary anywhere in the scripture. You can Right up my alley there. <laughs> <laughs> so, show me what buildings would have this glorious parking lot. Parking lot. Paved parking lot. Then the sons are free. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not obligated under the law. But I believe we're supposed to. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8, or 8, verse. Why don't I always take off my glasses? I think it's Deuteronomy 8. Yes, verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God this is under the old covenant. Mm -hmm. For it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Wealth is not money. It's See, government can pr pr uh, print money and can destroy it. But if you got wealth, you'll have, have, you'll have what you have need, no matter what form of money it is, okay? And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. God gives people wealth to establish his covenant. He just go poof. He works through the people to establish his covenant. Got a question for you. How much of your wealth have you given to establish the old covenant? Too much. Too much. Uh-oh. Too much. How much of your wealth? See, the principle's the same. <laughs> We should use the wealth that God gives us to establish the new covenant. New covenant. Because we're supposed to be about the Father's business. But how many of us have been supporting the old? We've been establishing the old covenant. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, we need to change the We need to repent. Change the way we think. Oh, yes. I know people this day that still give to the same church and all they've been taught is the law. It's what in the <laughs> it's easy to I mean, come on. But the principle's true. Yeah, right. Which covenant? Mm -hmm. Right. It no, sorry. going back to the love. Because I'm I'm really focused on love. It's easy. Do we need to leave? No. Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm just saying that. <laughs> so many times 
throughout my life, you know, and I've seen it and, and experienced it even in, in my my father's relationship with, with us. And it's easy for you to buy love by giving a certain amount of dollars. And and so people feel comfortable by being able to say, well, I gave, mm -hmm. so I don't have to do any more. Mm -hmm. All right, it's not, I, I don't, it, I'm not expected to do any more. What right. I you fulfilled to your do, obligation. Yeah, and, and of course, the one church we had to do the shackle and the half shackle, you know, and the half shackle was the extra, you know, that we had to provide, you know. And, Goodness gracious. And it was always about establishing a monetary yeah. amount. Sure. And that helped to establish your relationship with God. And I've seen this in marriages and I've seen this in families and fathers who would give their children X amount of dollars allowance so that they didn't have to go around telling the children that they love them all the time. You know, because I've already showed you I love you. I already gave you your allowance. And in my family growing up, my father did that to me. And one, and I remember one time I went to a Christmas deal in Oklahoma City Crossroads, and I took two friends with me, and Dad gave me a hundred dollars for Christmas. We turned around, he gave a hundred dollars to to Joe, and he gave a hundred dollars to Ronnie. And I thought to myself, they're not your sons. Why did you give them a hundred apiece? And they all that's the value of the love, didn't it? They all said, said, boy, we really like your dad, you know. And I'm sitting there going, but I just got my allowance is all I got. You guys got extra, you know. And and from that has constantly been in my head in working with God and, and so forth over the years. And, I, and I've constantly had that as part of my scenario of digesting these tithes and digesting all that money situation because of what my father, I mean, my grandfather made me do a promissory note when I bought stuff from him. It's wow. all legal transaction. But Pa, Grandpa, I'm your grandson. You're still going to do a transition. You're still going to do a promissory note to pay me for those caps. Okay. And I signed a promissory note. So it was all about that. It, uh, what one man said, the business part of God. Mm -hmm. And it's and I don't see God now no, in good. grace yeah. under a business yeah. aspect. I don't see him at all. I don't see him at all under monetary value. No. It's all love. No. And it's a different way of looking at the church world. Different way of living. And when you look at the church as, that's a place of love, man. It is awesome. It's love. Then you don't have to beg people for money. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to give because it's a great place to come. Mm -hmm. You know? No. And, and so when I see pastors begging for offerings, no. Then that's showing me that you're having to make those people pay to love you. Right. Like, like the father was paying me. Yeah. To how, love, how many times have you heard someone say you can't afford not to tithe? Oh, oh yeah. thousands. thousands. But it says don't give oh, grudgingly of ne or of necessity. It says don't give grudgingly or necessity, but you have to. Well, we have seen the really chubby peepee -pee -pee song when we were taking up offering because God loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. No, so we got to be really <laughs> cheerful while we're giving. Yeah, so let's sing it, sing it, uh, be song. Let me read this: Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the what? Law of Christ. That's one of the five laws of the new covenant: the law of Christ. It's also referred to as the law of love. Your address? Um, Galatians six three now. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing. Uh, he deceives himself. But if one, excuse me, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Don't, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Wow! For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will also reap of the flesh. Man. 
reap corruption, I should say. But he who sows to the Spirit will also reap the Spirit. Everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap it if we do not lose heart. Man. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. Man, this is powerful. It's that has nothing to do with tithing. It has nothing to do with the law. If you're, if I, I believe with all my heart, like you were saying, that if you go to church and you're being fed, be about the Father's business. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're being fed a good word of God, you need to share with that that ministry that's doing a good work of God. Right. It's not a mandate, right. but there's people, believe it or not, there's people that will sit in a church, hear the word of God, and never share anything of the, what they have. Mm-hmm. Then it says, don't be what God's not mocked. I mean, come on. Yeah. And I believe, see, I was guilty of this. Years ago, Joy and I were in the faith movement, and we used to hawk tapes. You ever know what a hawk, hawk and tape is? You know, you get those reporters, you carry with you, mm-hmm. and one person will buy a teaching series, a tape set, mm-hmm. and you sit there and you duplicate one for everybody. Yeah. Okay. That's hawk and tapes. <laughs> And you're giving this, you're giving this teaching out yeah. and not valuing it. Yeah. It has everything to do with value. If you value the Word of God, support the Word of God. Right. If you don't, don't. Right. Don't plant a seed in a ministry you don't agree with. I mean, it's like That's stop true. it. Right. How many times do you take an offering at a church before the guy speaks? Well, what if you're not going to like what he said? You just sowed into something you don't agree with. Exactly. That's stupid. <laughs> You know, it's true. I've got to get off my Let's get off my thing here. <laughs> but we used to see, it's all it's it's all about value. If you value, if I don't value the gift that if I don't honor her, I won't get the gift that I won't get the gift that's in her. If you don't honor Jesus, they didn't honor him in his own hometown, and so they didn't get what he had. You know, if you don't honor wherever you go and whatever you do, if you don't honor the person, you're not going to receive the gift that person. Jesus was the anointed, but he couldn't do nothing in his own hometown. Why? A lack of honor. It's not the the anointing is not the most powerful thing on the planet. Sorry, some people probably taught that. It's honor. Yes. Because if you don't honor, you won't receive the anointing. Now, if you honor, receive it, then it's going to be powerful in you. But you. Well, since the uh, scripture of sowing what, reaping what you sow, that is not, that's not law. No. That's, that's a creation. That, that's, that's a, that's not an old covenant law, that's a law of creation. Creation. Right. There's a difference. When it says that we're free from the law, it's, we're really saying free from the laws of righteousness. Right. You know, that's what we're talking about. We're, we're not under the law for righteousness. You go speeding down the street and get caught. You're breaking the law. You'll have to get a ticket. So, and the creation law flows into everything, right? So, comments, input, questions. This is our last night. The uh, say it while you can. He was going on and on about love. We just read First John four the whole thing. God is love. He's pure love. He's love. You know, it never says that God is the. There's the day of wrath, but He's not the God of wrath. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of peace. Uh, turn with me to uh, Joy. Put Isaiah 54. I mentioned. I mentioned peace. The gospel of peace. I don't know if you read. I'm sure you read this, but uh, I want to show you again. Isaiah 54. Verse 9. One of the things I learned in, in school in, um, in Wichita Falls is that fi- the 54 comes after 53. Mm-hmm. That's how deep my brain works. 53 in Isaiah is talking about Jesus and the sacrifice. Everybody understands that, right? So this is right after Calvary. Got it? And everything is in chronological order in the book of Isaiah. So right after Calvary, this is what he says. For this is like the waters of Noah to me, for I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. So have I sworn that I would not be, wait a minute, 
angry? Angry. You ever heard that God's angry? With you, nor rebuke you. Well, if God's not rebuking us, why are the pastors rebuking us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm not to hit a nerve on that one. so true. Oh, I know. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Man, this is in the Old Covenant. This is going over. This is the Old Testament talking about the New Covenant. Yeah. This is talking about the New Covenant period of time. Mm -hmm. 53 is the end of the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning of the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. That I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. Mm -hmm. Next verse. I know. This is the new covenant. Says the Lord, who has what? Mercy on you. Next verse. You need to read the whole chapter. Oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempests, and not... Oh, wait a minute. Let me go to the... Hold on a second. Tossed with tempests. Y'all can read it. I got 54, I think 17. 54 and 11. 17. Go to 17. I had to make sure. You ever heard of this one? No weapon formed against you will prosper. But you know they never finish the verse, do they? Mm -hmm. uh -uh. Would you like to finish the verse? No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises you against you in judgment, you shall... You're not condemning the person, you're condemning the word of judgment. Why? Because all judgment was poured out on Jesus at Calvary. That's right. And there's no more judgment on you. They're under the law. You're not. Right. Yeah. Every person speaks a word of judgment against you. You shall condemn. Who's he talking to? This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Not from myself. It's not from you. It's from him. Put Isaiah 56, 1. Isaiah 56 1. I mean, it's everywhere. I'm sorry. 56 1 says this. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness. This is under the old covenant. For my salvation is about. It's not here in the old covenant. His salvation is about to come, and my righteousness, not your self righteousness. But my righteous is to be what? Revealed. Yeah. Revealed. Wow. Just saying. The, the, the separation of the covenant. In, in Isaiah 54, 9. That is why there's the angels came and declared peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Put, put Isaiah... Uh, oh gosh, this is going to... Isaiah uh, 40. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Sorry, I had to search my files. Isaiah 40, verse 1. <laughs> comfort! <laughs> yes, comfort my people, says God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is over. That her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Is that the message the church is hearing? No. The war's over. God's always loved man, but he's always hated sin. What, said, what the angel said the night that Jesus is born. Peace on earth. God. Peace on earth. Goodwill towards. Yeah. There, see, God's always loved man, but he's hated sin. Right. So God had to deal with sin so he could love man. We'll throw this one up there. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Since we just said that, Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear what? 
sin he took care of the sin issue right there. Of many. To those who will what? Eagerly wait for him, he will appear a what? Second time. Second time. Apart from yeah. what? Because it's dealt with. This time we get salvation. Bringing our body. salvation. <coughs> That's when you get your glorified body. What? We're, 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 well, unless you have other things to say, we're going to end with this one. Turn to First John. First John. Chapter. First John, chapter one. Now I'm going to read this. Now I know you've already been set free, but just work with me on this one. Okay? Verse 8. Verse 7. Verse 6. <laughs> I'll just stop right there. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if, I, if we walk in light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with Him, uh, uh, fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay. Here's where we're starting. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. How many sin? Raise your hand. What'd you say? How many people sin? Raise your hand. Okay. Is everybody's hand raised? There? Okay. So if you raise your hand, you're committed to raising your hand. When we ask the question. For if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, excuse me, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you that you uh, I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, uh, the righteous, and he himself is our propitiation for our sins and not for our own, uh, own not for ours only, but also for the whole world. I'm going to change over to chapter 3, same author, same group of people. Verse 4, whoever, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawless. How many people commit sin? That means you commit lawlessness, right? Okay. This is so, shows you how easy it is for me even to put you under condemnation. And mess you up. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. sin. How many people in Christ? Well, not if you sin. <laughs> Keep talking. Listen. <laughs> Don't leave a thing in there. I said you're committed to raise your hand. Whoever abides in him does not sin. How many people abide in Christ? Then why are you sinning? That means you don't abide in him. See how easy it is to put you, make you feel bad about yourself? Whoever sins has neither seen him nor know him. How many people sin? Raise your hand. You've never even known God. Why do you say you know God if you sin? Pretty tough, isn't it? Wait a minute. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins. How many people sin? Raise your hand. <laughs> wow. That's an easy one to put you on a combination right there. Isn't it? Uh -huh. up, I get to come up front every Sunday. Dang it, boy. He who sins is of the devil. He has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God. How many people have been born of God? Raise your hand. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. You obviously have not been born of God because you still sin. No, we're starting to have a... Come on to the, Come right now. Get up here. Get saved again and again and again. Yeah. Over and over and over. Wow. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Remember, if you just don't raise your hand, you're a liar. And that makes you a sinner, so you've got to raise your hand anyway. Okay? 
Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born. How many people still sin? That means you're not born of God. Look at that finger. Now I could get all excited and get all hurt. I didn't tell you, you know, I could do all that, but no. See, the problem here is every time I mentioned the word sin, you thought of an action. Yeah, I know you did. Everybody does. Don't do that. The majority of times the word sin is mentioned in here, it's mentioned in a noun. If you say that you're not a sinner, you deceive yourself. If we confess that we're a sinner, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin nature and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If you've been born of God, you can't be a sinner again. We read it. We read it wrong. Yes, it's the verbiage. It's our understanding of the word sin. Yeah. Any theorist will show you that there's two words for the word sin. One's a verb and one's a noun. One is the subject. One is the action. We all see, because we're action works oriented people, we see the action of sin, not the nature of it. And it says in here, Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. He was manifested to destroy the work of the devil. What was the work of the devil? Put humanity into sin and create a sin nature. And that when you've been born again, born from above, you're no longer a sinner. You're a saint that's got a sin problem. And even in that case, it says you can't sin because that's a verb. Just say it. You wonder why people can put people into bondage every Sunday? Because you don't understand what it's saying. Mm -hmm. We're Americans. Mm -hmm. They don't know the truth. I mean, I, I didn't change a word. All I did was change the definition. Go look it up. I watched a pastor for years, a pastor, preach everything you just said in his all his son, I've never seen anybody go to the altar as much as he did in my life. It really it bothered me. Even at that time, it bothered me. So, I mean, thought that was a good I thing? Felt, no, I felt so... <laughs> no, he never so, could find peace. I felt so much sorrow for him. Mm. Because... He begged, he pleaded, he begged, he pleaded, he begged, he pleaded. It was constantly. And it was, was, and it was his son? It was, yes, yeah. his own son. And see, I remember see, it just stood out so much in my head. Hmm. Um, see, the principle here is if you think what you do yeah. solidifies your salvation, repenting, baptized, any of it. You, you, are your, you are your Savior. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not Jesus is your Savior. You are. Mm -hmm. That's why the Scriptures take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What thoughts are those? Self-righteous thoughts. If you think your obedience makes you righteous, take that thought captive and bring it in line to the obedience of Christ. It's not your obedience. It's His that we believe in. I mean, it says it's your obedience to the word. No, it's his obedience to the word. It's his obedience yes. to the law. I'm trusting what he did, not what I do and don't do. He's my savior. I'm not my savior. And then when I spend my time being thankful for all he's done, understanding the lavish gift of his love for me, what he did for me, hmm. then my natural response uh -huh. is a love response. Yes. Right. I don't want to go down and abuse it. It's not, to go out, it's not to go sin more. It's to raise up your hand. When you hear about the goodness of God, does it make yeah. you rush out and sin? Or make you raise up your hand? Yes. And say, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Who gets the glory in the message being taught? You or Jesus? And really, it, it goes back to what you were saying, Larry. It's, it's, who is getting all the attention? Me? And my lack of works, and me and my lack of anything, or, or me and what I did do, look how good I am, or Christ, and how amazing you are, Jesus, that you left heaven and came to earth just for me, so that you go to the cross and take all my junk. Oh, wow, I'm so in love with you. I can hardly stand it. 
Yeah. So grace is God's ability and our inability. Grace gives you, you're empowered to do more work than you were under your own flesh. Grace empowers you to serve the unservable, to love the unlovable. And grace to, covers our stupidity. Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> By grace. Yeah. And I'll say this, I started to say it earlier, I never finished it, but God is the God of several things. He's the God of love. He's the God of mercy. God of, God of, God of. Never do you see anywhere that he's the God of wrath. Right. It is something that's going to happen on a day. But just that day. His nature is love and mercy and peace. This is like the waters of Noah to me. Wow. Did he ever flood the earth again? No. And he'll never be mad at you again. <laughs> deal with that one people Father we thank you for this time you've given us to be here tonight Holy Spirit you're the great teacher we simply thank you for being our teacher giving us the grace to repent may we repent daily from any mindset that doesn't line up with the wisdom and the logic of your word within the dispensation of grace. May our hearts be founded in the foundation of grace, who is Jesus Christ. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at joy-coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.